video game emulation history, there are some moments when something truly revolutionary is unveiled that is both applauded and critiqued, even misunderstood, but ultimately something that changes the landscape forever. With the release of the Nintendo 64 in 1996, it came with a 64-bit processor and powerful 3D graphics. Nintendo skipped an entire generation of processor and went straight from 16 to 64 bits. This was the dawn of the 3D graphics era and the Nintendo 64 came complete with a powerful chip known as the Reality Display Processor or RDP. Super Mario 64 was the killer launch app and was a smash hit selling over 11 million copies. It's still considered one of the best games ever, even to this day. Here we go! But people wondered, what would it take to emulate the Nintendo 64 on a PC? Back then, emulation was in its infancy. MAME was around the 0.2 release, supporting mostly 8 and 16-bit games. Then there were other emulators like Nesticle that was a fast NES emulator that ran on DOS. Genesis was an early Sega Genesis emulator that was fast even on a Pentium based machine. Super NES emulation was still very early in its development. SNES 96 by Gary Henderson merged with SNES 97 by Jeremy Coote and became SNES 9X. Pentium based PCs had become fast enough to emulate 2D sprite based 16 bit hardware at good speeds. Around the same time on the PC was the push for 3D hardware accelerated graphics. 3D FX released the Voodoo 1 card in 1997 and quickly followed it up with the dedicated Voodoo 2 card in 1998. Before hardware 3D acceleration, games were rendered by the CPU in software, which used up CPU cycles. Hardware acceleration offloaded the 3D graphics code, leaving the CPU free to do more work. This meant that processor-intensive CPU techniques like particle effects could be easily done on a 3D card for almost free performance. With 3D effects and other 3D chip manufacturers getting into the PC market, and with faster Pentium and Pentium 2 processors, games like GL Quake and others started to push high frame rates. And people kept wondering if there was ever a possibility of emulating a Nintendo 64 on a PC at the time. Most people dismissed the idea. There was no way it could be done, they said. No way to emulate the power of the silicon graphics based hardware on a consumer level PC with a 3D card. You'd need at least an 800MHz machine, which was out of the question at the time, and extremely fast 3D. It didn't stop the fakes from coming in, however. People on Usenet groups would announce Nintendo 64 emulators on the PC all the time. Here's one known as the N64-MU, claiming 17 programmers developed it and it ran on a Pentium based machine at 120 MHz with a 3D card, and how it was coming soon. But this was clearly a fake. Posts like this frequented Nintendo 64 news groups. No one really believed it was possible. The 64-bit instructions and the 3D were so complex that there was no way you could make it run anywhere close to playable speeds. The first real attempt at a public Nintendo 64 emulator was known as Project Unreality. It started development in 1997 and by early 1998 could run some homebrew and boot into a few commercial games, but the emulator was very slow. Another emulator was announced known as Reality 64. This emulator was only in very early stages before being discontinued. But in January of 1999, History was about to be made. Two developers known as Epsilon and Reality Man spent only three months before quietly releasing a Nintendo 64 emulator known as Ultra HLE. The emulator took advantage of modern Pentium 2 processors and 3D effects cards like the Voodoo 3 and claimed full speed or close to full speed performance. The public had heard this before. Almost every day there was a new post on Usenet with another fake Nintendo 64 emulator that was just another virus. When Ultra HLE was announced, it was assumed to be the same. But word had quickly gone around that Ultra HLE was real. And when people booted it up, they were shocked. It's me, Mario! Hello!
Mario 64 was running on their 200 megahertz Pentium 2 PCs and they couldn't believe their eyes. Simply put, Ultra HLE version 1 allowed you to enjoy Mario 64, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Star Fox 64, Mario Kart 64, Doom 64, and around 15 other games at amazing speeds with the occasional glitches here and there of course, but these two developers had pulled off the unimaginable. Not only that, but because of the dedicated 3D graphics acceleration, it meant games could be up to 640x480, 800x600 or even 1024x768 resolutions, something that the Nintendo 64 hardware itself was not capable of. And playing Nintendo 64 on your PC on a CRT at those resolutions looked amazing. Make no mistake, this was an epic moment for emulation. I was there the day Ultra HLE was released and I was one of those people that downloaded it. I was a disbeliever that this emulator was actually real, but when I heard stories that it was real and it was fast as hell, I ended up downloading a couple of ROMs off a dial-up modem at the time, which took hours upon hours for me to actually download. But once I had downloaded these ROMs and started playing them on the Ultra HLE emulator, I was completely blown away. So how did Epsilon and Reality Man manage to pull this off? Full speed performance on a 266 megahertz Pentium 2. How does that happen? Especially considering that the Nintendo 64 to this day struggles on Raspberry Pi hardware at times. Ultra HLE pioneered a new approach to emulation. HLE stands for high level emulation. Before HLE, traditional emulation was all low level. In other words, if we look at something like a Neo Geo arcade system, we know that there is a Motorola 68000 CPU as its main processor, a Z80 coprocessor, and a Yamaha YM206010 for its sound. All these chips are emulated instruction by instruction in order to reproduce the exact execution of code. This is what is known as low level emulation or interpreted emulation. Low level emulation is not fast, but it is very, very accurate. Ultra HLE takes a completely different approach. The main CPU, the MIPS R4300, was emulated instruction by instruction via traditional low level emulation techniques. However, the RCP or Reality Coprocessor was handled in a completely different way. HLE works by intercepting the high level API graphics and sounds calls that the games were sending to the RCP chip and the developers figured out what they were doing and replicated them as best as they could. For example, if we take a look at the Ultra HLE RCP code, we can see these things known as display lists. A display list is simply a set of GPU instructions that are loaded and sent to the GPU in batch to be executed. And there are display lists for the graphics and the audio. Ultra HLE emulates as best as it can these display lists by intercepting function calls for all the 3D graphics including vertices, creating triangles and quads, texture mapping, background, culling and more. The 3D effects Voodoo Graphics API known as Glide can handle these display lists very easily. In fact, the card works in a very similar way to the Nintendo 64 3D hardware. Supporting these instructions to work on the 3D effects was simple to do. This approach meant that performance was fast. With the 3D effects managing the display lists, a fast Pentium 2 processor could handle the MIPS processor emulation, and thus the high-level emulation techniques was born. The drawback to this approach, however, is that intercepting of these function calls for the 3D graphics would vary game by game. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time has different address locations to where these functions are compared to, say, Mario 64. So patches per game needed to be incorporated, this was done via an INI file. But there's more to this. The HLE approach was flawed and only ever ran a total of around 20 Nintendo 64 games. While extremely fast, the compatibility percentage of the Nintendo 64 library of games was extremely low. And there was also the little thing known as microcode. The Nintendo 64 has this feature. This means that the graphics and audio can be completely programmable. In other words, to create new effects, optimize 3D graphics, add new channels to audio, and even more. Because microcode was completely customizable, it meant that any game that utilized it would not work. Developers such as Factor 5 use custom microcode in games like Rogue Squadron and Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, which incidentally took many years for the current batch of Nintendo 64 emulators to be able to play these games. 
After its launch, word about Ultra HLE had spread so quickly it was rumored there was around 300,000 downloads of the emulator in the first day. What was meant as a technical proof of concept to outline an exciting new method of emulation turned into most people interested in acquiring illegal copies of game ROMs. Due to the ongoing pressure of this, Epsilon and Reality Man removed Ultra HLE from their website and announced that they would discontinue the emulator. We do not condone the use of illegal ROMs in any form and this emulator was not designed to be used for this. The reaction we saw was not the one we expected. It seems the emulation community is not ready for something like this. The Ultra HLE project is now on hold and will be discontinued if this activity continues. Our aim is to develop emulation technology further, not to hurt Nintendo. Without them, none of this would be possible. In February of 1999, a few weeks after the launch, Nintendo confirmed that they were beginning lawsuit proceedings against Epsilon and Reality Man, with Nintendo singling out the authors in their statement. However, the lawsuit never went to court. Epsilon and Reality Man disappeared from the scene. There were some rumors that they both landed jobs at Nintendo working on the GameCube architecture. In 2002, the Ultra HLE source code was leaked and gave some good insight into how they managed to utilize the HLE techniques. Reality Man resurfaced in 2003 and made some updates discussing the next version of Ultra HLE, but only after a few updates he disappeared again. In the end, although Ultra HLE never saw another official update, its legacy and HLE techniques were used in many other Nintendo 64 emulators that ultimately surpassed the compatibility of Ultra HLE, but expanded on the very same technique that made fast Nintendo 64 emulation a reality on modern computers at the time. So there you have it guys, that's the story of Ultra HLE released for the PC in 1999. It was truly a historic and landmark day in emulation history and one that will go down forever. For those people that remember Nintendo 64 emulation, they'll certainly remember this day. And I want to hear your thoughts. Were you around back in those days when Ultra HLE was released? Surely you must have known about it. And I want to hear your thoughts in the comments below, your stories. What were you doing when Ultra HLE was released? Some of you are probably weren't even born when this emulator had come out, but it was really something that truly defined Nintendo 64 emulation going forward, even to this day, as well as many other emulators that utilize the HLE technique that we kind of just take for granted these days. It's all thanks to this one emulator that came out back in 1999. Well guys, I'm going to leave it here for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up and as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.